Welcome to our panel on the work of Robert Swain. I'm Jay Grimm, the consultant to uh, the art program at 375 Hudson. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge the sponsors of tonight's event, uh, Hudson Square Properties and Heinz. Hudson Square Properties, who own the building, and Heinz, who are part of the ownership group and who manage the building, have both shown a very deep commitment to contemporary art and expended significant resources to make this exhibition possible. And their support of the panel is further evidence of their interest in contemporary art. Um, at Heinz, I would specifically like to recognize Lenore Goldberg. Uh, <laughs> Lenore is uh, the curator of the exhibition and is always looking for opportunities to integrate art into Heinz portfolios around New York City. And, and is um, <clears throat> a fierce advocate of contemporary art. Lenore also asked me to send a shout out to Kate Fernando, uh, who helped set up tonight. Also at Heinz, I'd like to acknowledge Seth Werbit and Katie Sorensen. Um, these paintings, the 20 foot paintings don't just walk in and install themselves. Um, it was, uh, they've been both a great help uh, in terms of the logistics and uh, very gracious in all of their dealings with me and Lenore. So, uh, moving on to the subject of tonight's panel, uh, I don't want to take up too much time talking about Bob Swain since the whole panel is about him, uh, but I did want to recognize that he too has expended a great deal of resources here in uh, creating work. All of the work on view is brand new. Uh, was created specifically for this space and for this show. Um, and it is quite extraordinary to find an artist with uh, the means and the will to create 20-foot uh, paintings for our enjoyment. So I did want to recognize Bob for that. Um, <clears throat> a few words about our speakers. Uh, in the middle, you have Dr. Donald Cuspit, who is a world-renowned author and critic, published over 20 books. Uh, Donald Cuspit is probably best known for his pioneering work in the psychoanalytic approach to art history. Um, he takes a very keen knowledge of a clinical psycho, uh, uh, sorry, psychiatric practice uh, to explore why art is made and why it's appreciated. Um, Dr. Cuspit was for many years professor of both hist art history and philosophy at SUNY Stony Brook and helped establish that school as a premier graduate study program in art criticism. Among his many awards is the College Art Association's Prize for Art Criticism, and he's a regular contributor to a wide range of art publications, including Art Forum and Art in America. Uh, to his right and to your left is Dr. Tricia Lachlan Bloom, curator of American art at the Newark Museum. Uh, she recently curated Modern Heroics, 75 years of African-American art at the Newark Museum. And it should be noted that Newark was uh, one of the first museums to collect African-American material, and Dr. Bloom's show highlighted the many masterpieces in Newark's collection. She also recently curated a survey of contemporary artist Gabriel Daw's work. Uh, like Bob Swain, Gabriel Daw is very interested in art, in color theory, and the way in which colors are perceived. Uh, her current exhibition is the Rockies and Alps, Bierstadt, Calame, and the Romance of the Mountains exhibition, uh, which is on at the Newark Museum through mid-August. And finally, our moderator is Matthew Delegate. Uh, Delegate is an accomplished painter who made the rather brave choice about 15 years ago to open a gallery, minus space, in Dumbo, where he shows a program that embraces formal and technical skill uh, and abstraction, which is rather brave indeed. Uh, Matthew commends great respect among New York painters for his deep commitment to painting and his forthright way of doing business. So if you would join me in welcoming our panel, I'd appreciate it. So good. Thank you, Jay. Can, can all of you hear me? Okay, there's a lot of reverbs. So I just want to make sure you can hear me. Yes? Jay, thank you for the terrific introduction. Trisha, Donald, welcome. Very, very nice to be with you guys here on this panel. Uh, it's a true honor. Um, 
I guess, representing the artist side of all of this. Um, and um, I, of course, would like to thank Lenore Goldberg. We wouldn't have made, you know, this kind of an exhibition it just simply wouldn't have been possible. I think everyone in this room knows how important teamwork is in making stuff like this happen. This does not happen just because of, you know, anything at all. I mean, it takes a lot of people with a lot of resources and energy and time and goodwill to make exhibitions like this or programs like tonight's possible. So thank you very much to both of you guys. Really appreciate it. Now we um, are going to do something uh, that is kind of a two-part program this evening. Uh, Tricia and I have both prepared sort of brief presentations. Yes? Brief, yeah. Mine's 10 minutes tops. Yes? Okay. <laughs> Tricia's is probably 10 minutes as well. And uh, we're going to be showing some, uh, some images that are related to Bob Swain's exhibition. Um, and then we will dive into the second part, which will be a conversation uh, between the, the four of us, the three of us at least. Jay, yes? Great. About the works on view here um, as part of this exhibition, uh, Color Syntax, which is on view now through November 9th. So again, welcome everybody. Terrific to see you all here. And um, I'll turn it over to you, Tricia. Thanks, Matthew. You're very welcome. Uh, can everybody hear welcome. me? Um, Good evening, hello. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to talk about uh, Robert Swain's work. Um, I, I'm finding it really um, soothing to be in this environment, with this way that this work is transforming the business environment um, <coughs> as a large um, color field experience. Um, and so when Jay asked me to be on the panel, um, I was eager to take part in this conversation. Um, and he asked if I could show a little bit of an arc of uh, other art, color field, um, um, sort of geometrically informed. And uh, so it was really uh, fun for me. We have a wonderful collection of, of abstract art at the Newark Museum. In particular, we have a lot of strength in the area of, of geometric abstraction um, and color field. So um, I decided to just pick a few pieces that'll give you a sense of the scope. And I think the thing that, before I you know, move through these five or six slides, that I would like to point out that I think uh, as an impression about this work is that it feels like it's moving to me. And that's lovely because it's, it's very stable, but it also has a sense of, of flexibility and almost shimmering. So and all of, um, all of the works that I'm going to show you in one way or another are dealing with trying to create change an environment and create an experience based with purely color. So this is an early work. Um, it's a study for um, what we think is a kind of a color organ, a light projecting machine that Morgan Russell um, made a few of. So it's a small scale work on oil and cellophane pressed between glass and light was intended to project through it. Um, so again, very much a sketch for a larger project, but with the idea of, of filling a space with light in more than two dimensions. Next, please. Um, and I think um, Rob, uh, sorry, Robert's work is, obviously has a lot of relationship with Joseph Albers. This is um, a work in our collection, Almost to the Square Alone, which I think is a really evocative title. Um, the sheer number of works in this series that Joseph Albers did, just concentric squares, playing with the relationship between two or three colors, sometimes four colors, um, again, to create a sense of um, playing with space and movement. Um, so this is a large scale work, but not approximating, the, not nearly this kind of scale. But still, this is, I think, in the in 1960s, between somebody like Mark Rothko and Joseph Albers, where I see kind of color field and geometric painting really um, blossoming, and someone like Robert Swain coming in right around that period as well. Um, another colleague from this era, uh, uh, Richard Anaskevich, is a, um, maybe strongly associated with the op art movement, because when you see his works in person, they really do seem to oscillate this work in particular, uh, Rocket Red Apex, is quite large. Um, it's square. And all of the paintings I'm showing you, I was sort of looking at the dimensions again on the way here. They're all perfectly square. So there's something about that shape which is 
really evocative and so flexible. But this piece in particular, I think, has a very sculptural feeling. It seems to pulse outward, especially when you see it in person. Some people say it gives them vertigo or it hurts their eyes, but um, I think it's lovely, again, picking this one color of when I asked him, actually, uh, Richard Anaskevich visited and got to see this painting installed recently, and it was a gift from him to the museum. I love those stories as well. Uh, but I asked him about the title, and he said, well, that was the name of the paint that I used, Rocket Red Apex. <laughs> um, but again, making a, a reference to a shape, even in a, a concise title like that. Next. And this is another work from the same period. Uh, I'm familiar with the work of Leroy Lamas, who worked, who was a sculptor, but um, worked in different media, but really kind of made his mark working with uh, these transparent uh, squares within squares, again, of colored plexiglass that um, have a multi-dimensional feel and reflect the light. Um, so this is from 1964 again. Um, in some ways, a sculpture that has a very painterly feel. Uh, feels like a painting in some ways. I think the squares within squares become like lines in a painting. And another um, wonderful work from the 60s by Carmen Herrera, the great uh, Cuban-American abstractionist uh, who really um, pared down her geometric vocabulary um, very, very severely in this case. Um, cadmium red number four, another very um, direct um, kind of title that's the painting do the talking, not the title. <laughs> Um, and one thing I like to point out about this piece, if you haven't seen it in person, sometimes you can miss it, but the careful way in which she painted the very, very thin frame, you know, it goes from a white edge to red and then white, and then she leaves some of the wood exposed in natural color. So there's so much subtlety to so many of these works that um, I think come about when you spend time with them. Um, and in that way, they're kind of temporal pieces as well. They're demanding kind of more longer attention. And this is, um, this is another very temporal piece. This is called uh, Taurus Nine by the Palm Springs artist uh, Philip K. Smith. So this piece is all LED. It's um, acrylic plywood and LED lights. But the way it appears, um, is constantly changing. It's programmed so that if you were to stand there all day, you never see the same color sequence twice. It's just very slow um, and very, um, in that sense, very kind of, of moody. I, I think it's another piece that um, feels like it's pulsing um, and creating, again, a space around it that is, is demanding you to slow down um, and take some time with it. Um, so I see all of these artists as in some way, one way or another, kindred spirits with um, Robert's work, which I'm really enjoying. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you. That was great. Um, I've prepared uh, about 10 slides as well of things, uh, here we go, called 10 things. This is probably the, the least art historically sort of relevant kind of presentation I've ever put together. It's not uh, a kind of a conversation. Uh, in those terms, but I've had the great pleasure of working with Bob at the gallery that I run for about a decade at this point. And I feel like there are at least 10 things that people maybe should know about him that they maybe don't, based on what they see, what we see here at least, or what they've seen in the past. And um, I'm gonna walk you through these really quickly. Um, Bob's work, I think, often gets sort of contextualized with color systems, color theory, color charts. Uh, but its roots really begin in observation. Uh, as a kid, Bob grew up in Texas. He drew from life. He drew the environment. Uh, as a teenager, his family moved to D.C., where he really sort of taught himself how to look by going to places like the uh, National Gallery of Art um, and just examining paintings, this painting being a really particular one that he pointed out as being um, very influential in his thinking. Uh, he also worked as sort of a security guard, do-it-all handyman at uh, the Phillips Collection. So he got to know that collection quite intimately and spent a lot of time looking at paintings like this uh, Cezanne with, um, 
well with extraordinary modulation. And modulation is a big word that you can obviously see represented in the paintings we have on view here. So uh, observation is critical here. Uh, next one. Um, no artist comes out of the head of Zeus without being mentored, without being trained. Uh, there's two critical artists that I can think of that Bob has cited to me over and over again over the years uh, that have been hugely influential to him. One is Carl Knatz. Does he have work in your collection by any chance? Um, in the Newark Museum? Maybe. Uh, we have 12,000 objects. Okay, possibly. So, so I'm not to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> American Cubist, quite a big deal in the 1930s and 40s, was kind of tipped off his footing by the abstract expressionists in the early 1950s. Bob uh, worked as his studio assistant as a young artist, uh, 24 years old, 25 years old in Provincetown, um, and learned quite a bit from him about structuring space and about color systems. On the right, uh, a few years later after moving to New York, Bob worked uh, with the minimalist sculptor architect Tony Smith. Um, so this is a piece that Tony Smith uh, did in 1967 called Smoke that was in a show called uh, Cont or, or Scale as Content. I love that piece. Scale being an operative word in Bob's work as well. But Scale uh, as Content at the Corcoran Gallery of Art. And I point this piece out specifically because Bob actually built this piece by hand. So this is a piece that, that Smith sent him down to DC to actually Re kind of conceive and realize in space. So this is as much a work of Bob's thinking and know-how um, as Tony Smith's. So next one. Um, color research. Uh, here are two pictures of Bob with, my math is not so good, about 40 years between them. Um, 1971 and 2009. Uh, Bob has been uh, clearly working on, and most of you know this I think, but he worked for many, many years, decades, on developing his own color system. Uh, these paintings are not depictions of that system. Uh, if you want to think of the system as a kind of tool, like an instrument, Bob has kind of developed his own instrument, a musical instrument that he's been playing uh, over the last 50 years. Um, but it's rooted in a 30-part system. Each of those colors uh, is identifiable to Bob, and they modulate, again, around that circle with no beginning or ending point. And um, from those 30 colors, he then ran them through the kind of X and Y vectors of uh, saturation, sort of the, the purity of the color and the value of the color. Uh, his system in the end, and it's still a work in progress, has yielded about 5,000 separate colors that Bob knows really like the back of his hand. So when you see his works titled, untitled, 14 times 13 times 12, they're referring to index numbers for those specific colors. Um, but again, he's been at it for that amount of time. I think the works on view here are probably his most well-known format, these sort of repeating grids, but he's actually worked in a lot of different formats, including sort of striated stripes very early on. He's done a lot of works with equilateral triangles, whether it was in a triangular overall format or a hexagonal format. He's done circles uh, as well as repeating grids, and then in the roughly the 80s, 90s, did a lot of works that are what I would describe as kind of golden mean spiraling sort of grids where the grids change in, in size incrementally like a Nautilus shell. Um, so he's done a lot of different formats. Uh, in addition to uh, grid-based work, he's also uh, been doing brush stroke paintings, uh, which is what he calls them. He started these in the mid-2000s, about 10, 12, 15 years ago. Uh, with the intention of um, creating kind of an antithesis to this work, which he describes as a more passive color interaction experience. And uh, he kind of went in the opposite direction and created a much more active color experience. So this is an example of a brushstroke painting that is, again, as large as this, but with pixelated dots in a way. Uh, Bob has also worked in gray. Um, gray is important here, and these works rarely see the light of day other than in his retrospective a couple of years ago, but gray is as much a color to Bob as all the rest of them. Um, and he's done actually a whole body of work involving uh, the color gray. This one coming from 1986, if I remember correctly. Scale is super important to Bob. Uh, these paintings are large not uh, because of ego, uh, which you know a lot of artists I know, they want to make a big painting to make a statement. Um, these are big paintings because they need to function in a very specific way. After many, many, many years of research, and you saw those sort of six different kinds of formats that Bob has used, um, he realized after lots and lots of painting that a 
a square foot container, a 12 by 12 inch square, is the optimal size for color interaction um, in terms of his, his goals. Um, it enables each of those squares within the center to retain their own identity, but then also have the opportunity to kind of mix along the outside peripheral edges. So these paintings are as large as they are because they need to be that size. Um, and again, he's running you through this kind of color narrative over upwards of 20, 20 feet. Okay. Uh, Bob has had a long tradition of painting in public. Uh, this is a commission he did for IM Pay for the Johnson & Johnson headquarters. Uh, a painting from 1982 to 1983. It's 9 by 17 feet. Uh, of all the artists I know, he's got a very particular sensibility to the way paintings function in space. They, again, this work was made specifically for this location. And you can probably see that it repeats and unfolds and then folds back up as you go around the space. Uh, but this is something he's been doing for a very long time. So art in architectural environment. Uh, Bob comes out of a cohort of artists uh, that sort of, I don't know, maybe it was planets aligning that gathered in and around Hunter College during the 1960s. Bob started teaching there in the late 1960s. Uh, this is a faculty photograph, at least a partial faculty photograph from 1980, showing you some of the artists that were on, on staff there at uh, Hunter College. Uh, Hunter College is, at this point, uh, for me, and I mentioned it in the essay that I wrote for the catalog, uh, this is on par with the, what happened at the Bauhaus, what happened at Black Mountain College. There was something in the air and in the water and within that context that happened that um, foregrounded color as a concern, foregrounded abstraction as a concern, foregrounded painting as a concern, as well as sculpture. Uh, you'll note that this is a pretty white and male group. Uh, again, it is not like that anymore. It's actually much, much better. But I wanted to point that out as being part and parcel of that period of time. Um, Nanny Swain. Um, this is Bob's wife. Uh, he uh, has been with Nanny for 60 years. Plus, they were high school sweethearts in the uh, dedication in his um, retrospective catalog. He called her his heart and mind. And I just can't underestimate or overestimate to you guys, rather, the importance of this sort of core relationship. I'm lucky enough to be in one of these relationships myself, and this is everything. This is what stains the, the practice for now 50 plus years. Um, and Nanny is the kind of the invisible partner in all of this. So I love this photograph of them. This is from the late 1960s, early 1970s. Okay. And then uh, lastly, uh, this is a photograph of Bob uh, that was um, published in front of his work in uh, the um, Washington Post. And what was it? 19. Sorry, I wrote this down. 1969. Uh, standing in front of his work that was part of the Corcoran Biennial. <laughs> Um, I love this photograph of him. Uh, I love what this article says about his work. Uh, an intuitive spectrum. Look at Bob, uh, Bob Swain's paintings. It grows stranger. Um, and I think that's a really good starting off point for this conversation. Uh, both the fact that it's intuitive, Bob's been at it for so very long, and the fact that this was published several years before I was even born, just to stress to you how long he's been at this. Um, and it's such a high level. So. That's it for me. So you guys, thank you for, for being here and for listening to the opening kind of salvo of comments. Um, Donald, we haven't heard from you uh, yet. And I am curious to know, I mean, I've had the pleasure of knowing Bob and working with Bob now for a decade. I've seen this work. Um, I know where it comes from. But I'm actually interested in hearing from, from just the two of you about your first impressions of what you see here. Well, let me just say the following. Clearly, uh, Bob has a long and distinguished career, and I must say that a lot of the work you show I was not aware of. I'm only going to respond to these works, which I became aware of before. Uh, as an art historian, I immediately looked for precedent, and I looked to the European tradition. And what sprang to mind initially uh, was Loos's work, which is in the Museum of Concrete Art in Zurich. Uh, that was my immediate impression of association. Uh, the difference is that Losa has a firmer handling. This is, in terms of these particular works, a more subtle, lighter touch, put it that way, okay? The next thing that I notice, uh, you have a grid, standard modern form, 
uh, you have square, iconic, modern form, okay? So he's working very much in the modernist tradition. Uh, then I went to color theory, uh, going back to the 19th century, which is quite conspicuous derivative from that, okay? Uh, I also particularly thought of Delaunay uh, with the spectrum types of work. Uh, very interested in Sonia Delaunay, who did really the first color field abstraction, okay? Interesting thought. So he's very much in that dimension. Um, the uh, next thing that occurred to me, and it occurred to me as I was going through the work earlier, but I thought about it also in looking at reproductions of the work in terms of color theory. Uh, you may be aware uh, that there's Newton's theory that uh, light uh, and color are wavelengths. And this theory was attacked literally by Goethe in his famous theory of color in 1810, okay? And he said that it was an error, but he said at the same time it was due to, it was the way color looked in certain circumstances, okay? Now, Goethe had a very interesting uh, idea about color, and this is related to what I'm going to see here, what I'm going to say in these works. Uh, he said it all started with light, and then light seeing in different circumstances, you've got different <laughs> colors, okay? And I can give you more particular colors, uh, more, more particular remarks on that. He spoke about shadow, colors, etc. Now, what struck me in going through these works is the light that is here, the pure light that sort of keeps emerging in whatever way it emerges here. So, uh, and what this led to me to the following thought, uh, we seem to be somehow uh, on uh, some kind of cusp of relation between uh, Newton's idea of undulating color, the spectrum of color, uh, and uh, something to do with Goethe's idea. There are certain shadow colors here, as I look carefully at the work, certain kind of shadows that emerge as you look through there. Uh, so that's another thought I had, uh, that uh, maybe there was some kind of effort to, quote, reconcile, close quote, these two contrasting theories of color, okay? Uh, then uh, what uh, puzzles me, and still does, uh, this work is supposedly site-specific, as it were. It's related to the space. I don't quite get that, frankly. Uh, I don't see how it is quite related to the space. I'm looking at the wall. I'm looking at the texture. I'm looking at the grain in the wall. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I, I have a question mark over there. Uh, I can see these works on a completely neutral wall. I can see them... Uh, uh, of just plain white wall, the standard gallery wall, uh, makes sense, uh, but I'm not sure how it works here. The works in and of themselves are convincing as a kind of sequence, but I'm not sure about that. Then the other thing uh, that came to mind is uh, in reading the literature about Mr. Swain uh, and hearing, again, the remarks here, uh, talk about him being intuitive, interested in the phenomenology of color, uh, subjective dimension of color. I'm not sure what the subjectivity is that's going on here, okay? Uh, and uh, the reason I say that uh, is uh, I think in terms of a distinction uh, that Baudelaire made many years ago, uh, which I happen to subscribe to, he said there were two kinds of artists, uh, and he was speaking of modern artists, but perhaps broadly. A uh, very famous distinction, he spoke of what he called the positivist artist, that's his term. He took the term from Comte, the idea of Comte's theory of positivism, pure fact, okay, pure fact. And then he spoke of the imaginative artist. And he said the positive artist looks at the world as though he, the artist, is not there. There's no projection of the subject into the world, okay. The imaginative artist looks at the world and projects him or herself in some way into it. I'm using contemporary language of projection. Somehow he's seeing, seeing the world through the filter of uh, his or her own psyche. Uh, if we accept this distinction, I'm not sure of the imaginative dimension here, okay, in terms of subjective, Baudelaire's idea. What I'm certain of is the imaginative, uh, let's call it imaginative, uh, how shall I put it, reimagining of color relationships in a certain way. But I see this in a positive scope. So this work strikes me as a sample of scientific coloristic theory and I'm not sure about the intuitive subjective dimension that's operational here, or, or the intuition as the term that has been used in the discussion of this work in various pieces of literature. Uh, I admire it greatly uh, as an example of what I would call late musical painting, 
okay, going into uh, the famous idea of Kandinsky, but before Kandinsky, Pater, uh, and the whole idea that notes of color move like notes of music, okay, and we had a reference which I found fascinating to uh, Mr. Swain's invention of some musical instrument, if I understood you correctly. That was my yeah. yeah. So uh, I thought that was quite interesting. So one can see these as sort of notes, okay, playing notes musically. And then what I would like to do, if I had the time and, uh, to do it, uh, going to the idea uh, that there's always a ratio of musical parts, the idea uh, of uh, notes going here, and I'd like to be able to track that down and see how that would work. So I'm watching sort of changes of color. Some seem abrupt, some less so. I see sort of various ways, complementaries, non-complementaries, and so forth working. I'd like to be able to get that. So in general, what I would say is this is a very sophisticated uh, kind of purist art, okay? It's absolutely purist art, uh, uh, meticulously uh, precise. Uh, there is something more here uh, on the intuitive side, indeed, but I'm not sure how to enable it compared to Albers. Albers' interaction of color is completely mechanistic. Uh, you may recall that uh, Albers is a complete positivist. Uh, the famous remark that uh, Albers uh, wrote a letter to Harold Rosenberg when Rosenberg talked about the anxious object and Albers said An anxiety is passe, you know, if only, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, that uh, was Albers' attitude. That's the Bauhaus attitude, at least part of the Bauhaus attitude. Now, the Bauhaus reference was man mentioned here, and this is very important. As you may recall, the Bauhaus was divided between Gropius and Itten. There was a big conflict between them. Okay, Gropius was really a servant of capitalist industrialism. Okay, whatever his, we have the heritage of, of, of Gropius in these, if I may be subjective, or these wretched pencil buildings of all glass, uh, these absolutely unnuanced buildings over there. Okay, uh, but at the same time, there was Itten, who was eventually forced out of the school, and it was, quote, spiritualist, complicated idea. Kandinsky tilts. So it's Itten, but Tanginsky sort of knew how to play it both ways. So I'm, I'm thinking that this artist here is, uh, and, and I may be completely wrong in what I'm saying, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm completely wrong, maybe only partially wrong, uh, that uh, what you have here is an artist who wants to be, quote, in the tradition of on the spiritual and art, but the United States is not exactly a spiritual place, it's an evangelical place. Uh, so uh, that kind of mentality that you see in Itten, that in Kandinsky, with a very famous color theory, um, that is an issue. And again, I go back to Kandinsky, who made this very careful distinction between what he called the physical effect of color and the psychological effect of color. It's a whole chapter devoted to it. So I get the physical effect here. I think it works brilliantly, okay? Very you know, eye-engaging, really optical stuff. And I wonder if there's any connection to the Washington Color School as well, since uh, Mr. Swain worked there, I don't know. Connection there that was not mentioned here. So I see it there. Uh, I'm not sure about the psychological effect. I'm following Kandinsky's model here. Okay, that's what I have to say. Trisha, your, your impression. Well, <laughs> what else can I say? <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to say a few different kinds of things because um, I, I generally agree with all of that really thoughtful analysis um, because I see the precision, I see this very precise, um, careful kind of painting. It's not um, expressionistic in any kind of obvious way. Um, but I don't know, I mean, I feel like I have to get to know an artist better to understand and, and spend more time with the work to see like, as the heading of the article said, it gets stranger. Um, I will comment on things, associations that I can't help but bring to this kind of work, which is um, I think of technology and I also think of textiles. Right. And so, I mean, in some ways that's very Bauhaus too. Um, so I wonder if um, when, if those, if that mashup is in the artist's mind when they're making these pure abstractions, that don't have any other specific reference to lived experience, right? So it's either um, a textile, and now, in, in, I mean, maybe even back in the 1960s, there might have been that association of 
you know, the chromatic field and um, digital imagery and things like that. So, um, to me, there's more than one dimension and more than one way to um, experience these works, but um, when I keep looking at them, the thing that strikes me as, I think I brought it up when I was going through my, my mini survey of other color field works, is a sense of, of um, movement. They're not perfectly flat to me. They're, like, they kind of move in and out of our space, um, and that makes them kind of weird because that's going against this sort of strict grid. Um, but it also is perfectly in keeping with many other artists who are interested in space and geometry and color. Um, so that's what my, it was really interesting to think about the natural light because I also felt um, that I wondered if when Robert was painting them, if he thought about, if that's why they're, they go from darker to light, it kind of feels like the light is spreading into the space. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, in terms of like the site specificity, I'm um, looking around me, I, I agree because I also saw um, a similar work recently at the Visual Arts Center of New Jersey. Uh, I think it's still on view. Um, and the walls were white and I kind of had the same, similar experience. I feel that maybe site specific in um, the assertiveness of having the many works sequentially and um, the geometry of the space. I mean, again, this very um, hard edge modernist space being softened somewhat by the work. Um, that's, up, that's what I have to say. <laughs> Can, can I just... Jake, go, go right ahead. <laughs> Am I on? Um, I, I'm probably guilty of the, the whole site-specific canard. Um, these are size-specific. In other words, yeah. Bob thought of the proportion of the canvases and how they would fit uh, into the space. Um, it's interesting. I was privy to Bob's uh, conception of these paintings, and he approaches all of these projects with a great deal of rigor, and he has a fantastically um, complicated way of thinking about color and I believe when he begins a painting there's a certain um, intention that he has. He's trying to give the viewer a lesson in um, color shift and evoke an emotion and he knows what he wants to do when he begins um, but I'm convinced that it's, his system is so wildly complicated that he himself gets lost in it and at the end of it, he simply picks the colors that he thinks look the best, and that he's after something that's, that's beautiful. I could be wrong, um, but uh, just, uh, that's, that's something I wanted to throw in there. I like your size-specific idea. What I would want these works to be even larger. Mm -hmm. I would like them, I think it would be fantastic to take up most of this space, these containers. It would be quite extraordinary. It would knock out the rest of the space, and it would, above all, Apart from the wall, it would knock out these dark quasi columns as well. So that could be the power. I could see this piece larger, which of course would mean the containment would be lost. You'd have a whole different kind of, you'd have kind of mural as it were. And one might think of these in a curious way uh, in terms of tiles, okay, in terms of tiles. And why not have the tiles keep on going in, in some way, uh, as well as vibrating planes so you, he, was, I know he made a reference to Cezanne in some of the writing, the sensations. Uh, uh, since Cezanne's sensations were his sensations, uh, not so clear that they really were in Mont Saint Victoire, uh, really. But uh, how about uh, these vibrating sensations, as it were, vibrating planes? And I think that is a major achievement to get that thing to vibrate. Okay, and I think the size of it would do it. You know, uh, and I think perfectly capable from what you've shown that he could do this. He could fill each of these walls. It would, it would really be a knockout, and I think it would be uh, just, just uh, truly magnificent. These works are, uh, I would say, more museum size, if I may say so, uh, rather than, what should we call this, an arena or something, uh, size. So one of the... Um one of the images I did show, so Bob does actually work larger than this. Yes. Sir. So one of the images that I showed was of a show he did at the Santa Monica Museum a number of years ago, where the works were 
actually two feet taller, so they were 10 feet high as opposed to eight, mm -hmm. and um, stretched from 30 in one work to 50 to 70 feet in, oh, in a third too. work. So actually he does work much larger than that. So, tr so Trisha, I want to pick up on something that you said in your very first comments about the show, mm -hmm. which is you find the works, I guess I want to get to the, sort of the emotive quality of these. Um, and again, I know that you may or may not agree with this, but you, you mentioned the word soothing. Soothing. Soothing early on. You also mentioned um, that they've got a lot of movement and they sort of shimmer. Mm -hmm. um, is there an emotive sort of quality to them? Do you see emotion in these works? Uh, well, no, not directly, but uh, in terms of their effect and then creating, um, opening up an opportunity for, an, again, like that line between emotion and sensation is a hard one to pinpoint, right? Like the, it's soothing to the eye to look at those colors versus the um, kind of uh, menacing architecture that it's set within. Um, so. Again, um, the emotion part is something that I think, I don't know, everybody responds differently to abstraction. <laughs> um, and so some people can look at, for instance, you know, Barnett Newman Stations of the Cross and be completely unmoved, and other people can break into tears, right? So um, to me, I, I, I appreciate the experience of them, but I don't find them particularly emotive. I would have to understand more what goes in, as, as, as Dr. Cuspa was saying, um, the very, very calculated way in which they're constructed doesn't lend itself to sort of an emotional reading for me. Mm -hmm. Great. I think Newman's work uh, would not have the credibility it has without the theory, without his writing. If you got rid of the whole concept of sublime uh, and you look at Vir Heroica Sublimis, uh, you would take seriously Panofsky's dismissal of the idea that this is very heroic as sublimus and just see some thin lines, a sort of a emaciated phallic figure, uh, emaciated totem, leftover totem uh, figure there. I think the color handling here is much more subtle. Uh, the nuancing here is much more subtle than anything uh, that you find uh, in Rothko. Um, in relation to affect, let's use that word, mm -hmm. I think this is very interesting, uh, the emotion, affect. Um, I, think of this along the lines, uh, again, a little bit of, so to say, psychological idea. Analysts speak of um, neutralized uh, instinct, okay, uh, neutralized energy. I see this as neutralized color in some way. Uh, that's not a negative. It means that it's not hot, it's not cold, it's not aggressive, it's not erotic, if you take those two drives. It's just neutralized. It's there. Okay, and it's there to be used by the ego. And this is an artist who's ego. These are ego works. And the sign of the ego is the control, the extreme control here. Maybe, as Jay says, it becomes just doing this and that, but there's some sense of very determined control here. And I admire that very much. Uh, and I think that helps it transcend just reducing its technology. But I'm not sure so it's a sort of, sort of a master of technological technique of color and so forth. But I'm not sure that uh, that gives it a full affective resonance. There's something about these works that lend itself to, I would say, a disinterested contemplation, to use that old-fashioned term in art. So I can enjoy contemplating them. Kant's idea, disinterested. I get it. I can contemplate it. It's high art in that sense. But it's not this emotion, it's not that emotion. It's not erotic, it's not thanatopic, okay? It doesn't go there at all. And it's not making some kind of point as say Delaunay is making, or as Seurat is making. It's not doing that. It's pure, it's pure. And there's a kind of, quote, sublime that's operating within that, okay? Somehow, it's not, ex not exactly Kandinsky's kind of trans transcendence, but there's some kind of purity that comes through the neutralization. Okay, it's a very interesting kind of work. I, I, I would put it in a sort of different category than these other artists. I think it contributes something new, if I can use that wretched word, because uh, it's so <laughs> used over and over again, uh, that uh, to the tradition of, let's call it, color 
school painting, which is such a, a modernist tradition. Great. You used the word sublime. Yes? A uh, terrible word, but yes. yes, I used it. But you also mentioned that there were the, uh, that uh, there was a show in Los Angeles. It was an existentialism in art, abstract art and existentialism, something like butchering the title of it. Yes, I was involved with that. Exactly. Think, yeah. um, Trisha, I know that you have a show up right now of artists who paint gigantic landscapes. Bierstadt, yes, yes. in yes. some cases. Is there a relationship between that work that you have on view? So there's a show that, um, that Trisha curated called the Rocky, no, it's the, oh, the sorry, Rockies in the Alps. Exactly, the Rockies yeah. in the Alps, excuse me, I'm butchering the title. Rockies in the Alps, looking at mid 19th century painting of landscape. Yeah, um, well, we do talk a lot about the sublime in relation to 19th century landscape painting. Um, and scale is very closely associated with sublime, that feeling of being overpowered by something greater than yourself. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I don't know how we kind of got brought up Barnett Newman, but like the idea in abstract expressionism, this idea of the sublime got really snatched up and run with, right? That um, through scale, almost anything can be called sublime. Um, <laughs> but I think the, when you go back to the original meaning, it has to do with um, your relationship to nature. Um, and I don't, I, so I don't have the same kind of experience with this work because um, I can, I don't feel overpowered by it. Um, I, I like the scale, you know, and I, as I said, enjoy getting to know work over time. <laughs> um, but I think that, um, I think it's different. It's more, um, it's more like, it feels as, it feels um, like easel painting, you know, and that's, and when I say that, I mean kind of like abstract easel painting, the whole thing with modernism of the, you know, I say the flat surface of the canvas, but then you also have that feeling of, of movement and depth. Um, but it, I think I agreed with um, Donald that it, it feels very controlled. It doesn't feel like, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but I'm saying like I had a different experience in front of um, like Rocket Red Apex, which almost feels like a punch in the face. That it's much more, the sense of movement is more um, forceful. Um, this is, um, it's, it's beautiful, and I, there is a sense of, of movement, but it's not one that, that is, feels disruptive in any way, which is what I think uh, the experience of the sublime goes back to, that, that jarring feeling that you are very small in the face of the universe, or you might fall off the cliff, mm -hmm. something like that. Well, very important to notice that a few years ago, uh, there was a really major critical revision of the theory of the sublime by a feminist thinker, uh, the idea of the feminine sublime came in, a very, very important idea, which I uh, recently used in writing about a Japanese uh, woman abstract painter. And uh, the masculine sublime is about power, okay? Put it simply, phallocentric power, if you want to put it that way. Uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm really referring to this writer, a uh, very important writer. And uh, the feminine sublime is about intimacy put it that way, okay? It's a little more complicated than that. These works are not about power. Uh, there is something very intimate about these, and particularly the movement from square to square. It's very intimate, it's very interesting. So I'm not saying it's feminine sublime, but I'm very happy that it's not the masculine sublime, uh, uh, two prominent examples being Pollock and Newman, okay? Classical examples. So it's not about uh, overwhelming you with power. In Kant's discussion, he talks about uh, examples, the Schaffhausen Falls, for example, mountains that seem unclimbable, etc. And the argument of the feminine sublime is, after all, you can't climb the mountains. You measure it, they're limited. The feminine sublime is not limited, okay? It's a very important concept. And I think some of the most interesting abstract art that's happening now, at least that I've seen by female artists, uh, involves the feminine sublime. Now, I don't care, this is, this is gender neutral art, okay, in a sense of gender neutral art, but it's very intimate on a perceptual level. 
Okay, which is quite interesting. It's very subtle, really quite subtle. Just moving, if your eye moves along, if you have the patience to move along, not just scan it, but move along that way, that way, that way, you can move many different ways. It's quite extraordinary. So I'm willing to say that this is a welcome relief uh, from the bombast uh, of the masculine sublime, the uh, abstract expressionist, the New York school, uh, that kind of uh, thing uh, that uh, New York school is known for. I think it's a welcome alternative uh, uh, to, to this. Terrific. Did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that sounds good. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. Jay, anything? No. Try it. Well, um, we're all it, on the feminine wavelength. You know, it's, it's interesting to think that, uh, of course, the minimalists were in opposition to the abstract expressionists and wanted to create a vocabulary and an art that was much cooler and uh, at a remove and relied on geometry um, and hard edges and so forth, which we see here. Uh, but I'm not sure I would call this minimalist art either. Um, it, it's perhaps uh, adopting some of the strategies and some of the vocabulary of minimalism, but uh, it's adding something significant. Yeah, I would go so far as to, to for me, it feels like um, it's, it's probably, <laughs> artists probably wouldn't agree, but that it's, it's kind of playing with minimalism. It's taking that heroic shape and it's uh, the iconic in and of itself, the way that, you know, um, Albers made it um, infamous um, and turning it into a kind of pattern in a way. And then also not leaving the pattern as something static, but making it something flexible, which is, again, that's a lot going on in a very um, precise approach without resorting to, you know, even a, t a title on the work. You can get all that from looking at it. And I think it's interesting how much titles sometimes play into the way that we experience art. Like you suddenly know what to think about the work because of the title that was assigned to it, right? Um, so that um, very modernist uh, withholding of emotion through title and narrative um, being absent, you know, something again, you either come up with it on your own, it becomes your own um, thing that you're projecting onto the art, but... Um, and then you take that risk of that people will say, oh, it's just formulaic, or they're not gonna look past their glimpse of it. Um, I think there's a certain, um, for abstract artists, that's a risk that you, you don't look long enough to really understand the subtlety of it. Um, well, Matthew, you talk about that in your text for this show, how much time these works require. Yeah, I feel like they reward looking, like extensively long looking. Um, I think the more time you spend in front of them, it's your eyes need a bit of time to calibrate to the, the palette, the energy, the value shifts, the hue shifts in them. And you get acclimated to seeing them. It's like getting acclimated to seeing in the dark or getting acclimated to sitting in a movie theater, it takes time. And then once you start that process, or once that process is completed, you start seeing things in there you don't, at least for me, you don't normally see on first impression. Um, and they become, over time, infinitely more complex. And the, I mean, you mentioned some anomalies here. There were sort of points in some of these works. Those, there's certain squares in them that start to stick out. Well, why? why is this this color between these two colors or on the diagonal between two other colors? Um, I've actually had the great pleasure of sitting in the gallery with these for two months at a time, and they're very different works uh, when they leave the gallery than when they enter. Um, just you see different things in them, so they do reward long looking. Now, if you can believe it, we only have a few minutes left in this panel discussion. I feel like we're just getting started. I literally have... Ask some questions. Yes. I literally have dozens more questions to ask you guys, but I feel like we should turn it over to the audience. Turn it over to you. Um, your impressions, any questions you want to ask of our panelists, uh, questions about the specifics of the exhibition, anything at all. Yes, there's a, a mic. 
Hi. Um, the one thing I, I enjoyed listening to you all, but that I didn't, I don't feel that has been sufficiently addressed is uh, the effect of light. That, uh, in my opinion, the accumulation and the movement of light that emanates from the images does uh, introduce something very subjective, more like a Lewitt, when you have an accumulation of squares that becomes almost Baroque, leads you somewhere else than where you started. Anyone want to respond to that? Well, I did speak about the flow of light that works through here, and I think the word subjective has to be put in quotation marks uh, as to what is exactly evoked, that is, what affect or feeling is exactly evoked. And that is not clear to me. Light has all kinds of associations, uh, etc. So uh, if you see the light here, though, in the context of all the color, uh, I'm not sure uh, that uh, it would uh, work in, so to say, in entirely in subjective terms, as I think what you're suggesting here. But you know, light as uh, see the light, you know, it's, it's just uh, uh, an uh, age-old idea. So I think that's quite implicit. And all of these works show modulations of shadow, of light, etc., all through the whole thing. Um, it should be noted as well that this space wasn't designed for the display of uh, subtle abstract paintings. So it, it is a credit to Bob, who was painting these in the middle of winter and now showing these uh, in the, the bright light of the summer, uh, that he's pulled off something here. Um, but it, uh, just to be very uh, logistical about it, it, it was pretty tricky mm -hmm. for him uh, to, to know exactly what the light was going to be here. Could I add something to that, which I feel, feel is an interesting thing that you brought up, that you associate these with light? Bob has talked at length written at length about color being light. I mean, that's literally what it is. It's very different than, Tricia, the work that you showed that's part of the museum's collection by Philip Smith. Is that his yeah. name? Yeah. Philip Smith, which is literal light. It's literally LED light that is changing over time. These appear to be lit from within in a very interesting way. So your association, I think, is, is right on, at least for me. Are there other questions? Thoughts, yes. Oh, and could you speak into the mic because we're recording today. Thank you. And I just wanted to say with the light, having that Vermeer piece shown early on is a perfect segue, I think, because if that was a piece that really influenced Bob, the lighting in that kind of painter's work, you can see it in this, even though it's almost like it's become digitized through the, you know, the painting process of minimalism in the grid. Distilled, distilled. Right. You had a question? Yes. I did too. Um, yeah, on that topic, I have been sitting here experiencing these as stained glass windows. That's my association of, as you said, the light is emanating from them. And it's, it just, I, I think of where do I see these jewel tones elsewhere in the world? And that's just my association that I'll add. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that, because Trisha, I think you mentioned textiles, yes? Yes. And um, technology. So you're mentioning stained glass window as well, which is a, an interesting analogy. Any thoughts on that? To stained glass or the tradition of stained glass? Well, there's something happening in Europe now, which is quite interesting in Germany, uh, particularly uh, in Zurich, uh, where abstract windows are being installed by contemporary artists. There's one in uh, by Polka in the Zurich Cathedral, um, and uh, I've seen others in Germany. I took a tour of it. It's quite interesting uh, that there is the recognition uh, among the uh, curators and people involved with the church uh, that uh, modernism has this kind of abstract modernism, broadly speaking, uh, works terrific with light coming through. Uh, I would just make a, a kind of a I understand that, 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 that feeling of rich light that is accentuated in stained glass, maybe more than other places in the real world. There's a strong association with that. And um, I think that some artists are just very, very sensitive to light. And obviously, Robert is one of them. Um, and I just kind of make another comparison that um, 
an artist that we worked with in 2015 and that Matthew has worked with named Gabriel Daw, who is also an abstractionist and he does it in color and space. Um, and he makes these constructions out of thread that are, again, shift and change. They're very trans they transform the space. But one of his influences that I found fascinating was he grew up in Mexico, going to churches a lot. He was raised as an atheist, but he connected with the light with inside the churches so that that was an influence on his, again, completely uh, non-objective abstraction that biography creeps in sometimes. Um, and sometimes an artist lets you know about it and sometimes they don't, what they're thinking of when they, what, what their associations are. But I think that's perfectly valid and it makes sense. I think a lot of, you see a lot, a lot of contemporary artists interested in, in light as a medium um, in different ways. Thank you. Other questions, yes. Hello, uh, this is kind of a, a comment on uh, it being site specific and also you had mentioned uh, at the beginning of the discussion how these paintings change the space. So as I've been sitting here listening to you, I've also been seeing the colors from the paintings being reflected on the floor and like streams of greens and reds reflecting and also seeing the sunlight, the way they hit the paintings and the shadows from the trees bouncing off and how that's changing the colors. So I was thinking about the idea of it being site specific and kind of these marble walls which have been cut from this natural earth element in the floor as well and made geometric and flat. I'm kind of thinking about the paintings in a different way where they're starting off as this rectangular and square pieces, but it bringing it back to like an earth element and again back to the idea of light and that experience kind of like a fundamental thing that exists in the world. So anyway, it's more of a comment, but coming from comments that you had made. Thanks. Thank you. Any thoughts? Um, well, it is interesting. When we were, when we were planning this discussion, um, we thought it'd be kind of weird to be in the lobby because people would be walking through and making noise and interrupting the talk, which turned out to be the case. However, uh, Lenore made the point that it would it'd be integral that we'd be able to see the works while they're being talked about. So I th I'm glad you responded to that. Um, it was the very reason we had it here. There's, there's an important uh, issue that's being raised here right now. A lot of modern architecture is very anti-painting. Okay, uh, when uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, museum in New York was first opened, there was a protest by uh, close to a thousand, if I'm not mistaken, uh, art historians, uh, artists, etc., that it was not fit uh, to show works of art. Okay, you're on a slant to show paintings. Um, uh, Basilitz made a particular remark, just let's have a nice barracks, maybe that's German or something, <laughs> uh, and you know, nice walls and so forth to show it. And uh, I see a number of modern artists, uh, for example, Chihuly as one example, uh, working against architecture, okay, against architecture. And I think what I like about these works, just from that point of view, is they defeat the architecture of this space. I would want them to defeat it even more. But architects, you know, really don't care about painting flat surface. I'm really serious about that. They're not interested at all. They're interested in their structure and they want just their materials, etc. They don't want competition, okay? And I think this is very important that these works do succeed in bringing a certain, call it life, to this space. Because if you look carefully, this space has a kind of mausoleum feel, if I may say so. Uh, I, I'm overstating, with all due apologies, Ms. Colbert, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the height of it, the, the, the dark tonalities of it, and thank God for the light coming through, uh, you know, etc. So you get a bit of, uh, you know, there's, there's how we say, a dark tendency here, okay? Uh, there's darkness in this white here. And I looked at the floor, and the floor destroys everything. The floor destroys everything. It's, the work can beat the floor. That is something. You just look at it as a competition between this floor with all its busyness and these works subtle. That is quite extraordinary. That, to me, makes the whole kind of frisson, which I happen to like very much. So who wins the battle? Okay. Well, the floor is going to be here forever, I suppose. 
um, and the material is different. But I'm convinced that the artist did this because he said, hey, I can do abstract expressionism too, okay? Or something like that, some pseudo-abstract expressionism. The floor artist. I'm yes. sorry? The floor artist. The floor artist, the floor artist. artist. Yes. Yes. absolutely. <laughs> Are there other, yes? Yeah, sure, no, I'll just pipe in about the size and scale, which I think works really well, at least for me. Um, size being like the physical measurement and scale being one's relationship to it. And my thought was that if the paintings were larger and perhaps even to the point where they were to eclipse the architecture, then they risk becoming decorative. And I think that that's something that um, Harold Rosenberg talked about with the abstract expressionists and this apocalyptic wallpaper. But at this size and scale, I feel like they still maintain their physicality and they remind you that, you know, there's no doubt that these are paintings. And so, in that way, um, they work well for me. Great. So they strike an equilibrium, in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, Greenberg said one of the tasks of modern abstraction was to finesse the decorative. Okay. A very important idea that he had. Uh, and uh, I would say myself that his notion of the decorative is quite different than what you have here. Decorative meant repeated pattern from him. He spoke of wallpaper, redundancy. Uh, I happen to like some wallpaper, okay, but the point is that uh, these work, if you want to speak of it in those contexts, uh, do finesse the decorative. That is, they don't reduce themselves to a redundant pattern of whatever color, design, shape, square, whatever you want to call it. So I think they do succeed in that important modernist task as defined by Greenberg. There's a question in the back. So I, I just have one question, and excuse me, I'm not an artist, I'm actually a suit. So, but I've, I've lived in here, I've lived in here really for 18 years, and these were sort of the first paintings that caught my attention in a positive way. And which was interesting, I mean, we've had some pretty dreary artwork in here <laughs> for years. So, and you say it's dark in the lobby, I say it's dark in the building when I come in here to go to work, but I, I'm just curious, if you're colorblind, and maybe this is, how does this work affect you differently if you're not, or is, it, is, any, is that, am I off base there? I have no idea, like, in terms of, because I, I, a lot of these squares, there's, even for me, and I am colorblind, I have a tough distinction between some of them look so similar to me, and I get that they're different hues, but I can't always distinguish a box here or there. I'm, so maybe I'm answering my own question, but I don't know if that's ever come up. It's all about color. If you're colorblind, what are you seeing versus right. what others are seeing? I don't, I don't know. Thoughts on that? The Is it red, it red, green you don't see, or? It's, yeah, it's red, green a little bit, but it's, I'm not fully, I just, I can't distinguish mm -hmm. all the hues, or I think like something up there looks like different, similar to something down there. I don't know if that's ever come up. But can you tell? had a positive effect for you, in comparison to the other in things. I, know, I don't know what I'm doing, it's positive. So I leave it to other people. Right. You know, I leave it to creative people and artists, <laughs> so, but. Thoughts on that? Are you able to sort of perceive the changes in light darkness from square to square? Sure, right, say that some are so nuanced, I think the squares are the same. <laughs> Interesting. Thoughts? Oh. It, <laughs> it's interesting, you know, collectors of old master paintings often request black and white photographs of the objects that they're, con paintings that they're considering acquiring because they don't want to get distracted by the color. They want to be able to judge the light and dark values within the painting and make sure that the composition uh, is successful in that way. Um, so, Hopefully, if the artist has done their job, um, even without the color, these paintings will carry the day uh, by the shift in, in the light and dark tonalities. Yeah, Bob was actually, it's interesting you bring this up, Bob was included in a pretty important exhibition in the late 1960s called Art of the Real at MoMA, at the Museum of Modern Art. And um, they published a catalog for that show and they reproduced Bob's work <coughs> in it in black and white. And I always found that image so interesting because it does actually convey the concerns of the work, although you're not seeing it in color. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
Um, I'm also a suit, and I worked here for 20 years. And <laughs> I'm actually an artist by training, and I am colorblind too. So um, one, thing that's, one thing that's great is I come in here every day. I've been coming every day for 20 years. And I was saying to my new friend here that it's kind of like a fragmentation of sunrise or sunset. Like it's this, it's a white space for us now because we've seen this lobby every day for so long. And so the marble doesn't matter and the colors don't matter behind the, mar uh, behind the paintings because this, is, this stands out for us. And I see the same things you see. I'm red, green, color blind. So we see gradation of, of, of hues. But like what he's saying, like the, the, t the two colors next to each other might be the same color to us. Mm -hmm. But we also see more shades of blue and we see shades better, actually. <laughs> so there's a whole science behind it. Um, and I'm, I'm an artist by training. I work here as an artist. And I had to do colors by numbers. So I use the Photoshop and I look at the, the number of values. So if you tell me what a color is, I can kind of see it after you tell me. But it's, um, and again, this is, a, I mean, we've, we've had great artwork here before, Frank Stella's artwork, but these are probably the most positive works we've had here. Super. So, so thank you for that. On, yeah. <laughs> On that note, I would like to thank our panelists, Jay, Trisha, Donald, thank you very much for participating. Really enjoyed your comments. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, Bob's show continues through November 9th, uh, so there's plenty of time to come back and see it and see it again and again, and I would highly encourage you to do that. You will see different things, I think, each time you, uh, you visit his show. So thank you again to Lenore and to Jay for hosting this conversation this evening. And that's that. Thank you, guys. Cool.